Welcome to Ray Duhon Ministries. We encourage you to download the supplemental study guides, charts, and articles to help enhance your study of tonight's subject by going to the articles page on rayduhon.com. We also encourage you to check out the sermons and other PowerPoint presentations from various church growth programs and other materials throughout the website. Without further ado, here's Ray. Welcome to Homiletics 101. This is the class that will teach you how to dig out what God actually says in His Word. We're going to teach you how to explain the text, apply it, and then draw a response from your audience. This will enhance your teaching abilities with a very simple and easy to remember method of putting a lesson or sermon together. Let's take a look at the slides together. In our class on 101 homiletics, what we're going to see today is how to build a message. Now, you cannot teach something you do not understand. There are so many things as to why there are so many different religions, and that's because of people have their own agenda. People are comfortable with their own limited view. They prefer to stay ignorant. So they're going to ignore what the Bible has to say. How many people do you know that actually watch or read the Bible? People also don't really want to know what God has to say. When we take a look at that, that's a pretty phenomenal, significant there that we don't, people don't want to see what God has to say. They don't want to sit, that what they do want to do is sit on the throne and dictate to others what they will do and what they won't do. And they will tell them everything and under the sun and be able to say this is what the Bible says for them to do. But probably one of the biggest reasons is that people don't want to face the truth. When it comes to stuff like health, people just don't want to hear about it. They just It's not something they want to think about because after all, hell is where people just go to burn. and They're right about that. Well, here's the thing. The scriptures teaches us that we need to do our best to present yourself to God. Remember who we are actually working for as a tried and true worker who isn't ashamed to teach the word of truth correctly. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Here's the thing. When you understand that God is the one that has put you in the responsibility of teaching his message that's what's going to happen. So how do we teach the word of truth correctly? Well, we start with a strong foundation. There are three principles of understanding all scripture, including prophecy. A lot of people think, well, prophecy is apocalyptic and you can't understand it anyway. Wrong. When you apply the principles of understanding all scripture, you're going to be able to understand it. Let's take a look at them. The first one is God is omnipotent or all-powerful. If God can do anything he wants, that also means that he is powerful enough to communicate with us in such a way that we can understand it. So yes, we take that premise right off the bat. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And he can and does communicate with us in sometimes very simplistic ways. There's also three foundational scriptures that all scriptures are built upon. When you talk about the, the man building his house upon the rock, at this point, these foundational scriptures are those rocks that all scriptures are built on. The first one is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And the second one is like it. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20 and 21 says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but God, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Notice, first of all, these two verses right off the bat show who the author is. It is God. God inspired all scriptures. And it is God who has spoke through the Holy Spirit 
and gave it to the people so that they would be able to write it down. And that includes prophecy. Now look what prophecy actually says there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Happy is the one who reads this book, and happy are those who listen to the words of this prophetic message and obey what is written in this book. For the time is near when all these things will happen. In the Good News Version, one of the things that we have discovered is that in this case, you cannot do anything if you don't understand it. You cannot obey uh, something that you read and listen to unless you understand it. So God here he expects us to obey, which also means he expects us to understand what is being said. And the third principle the scriptures have the final authority over any and every opinion. If the scripture says it, the matter is settled. I've heard a lot of people want to argue with that and say, my opinion is more important than God's opinion. And they'll argue, well, we just have to agree to disagree. Well, that's another lie right there because we don't have to agree to disagree. Because when God gives us a message, he wants us to deliver his message and not our opinion. So we're going to start with that strong foundation by continuing with 10 basic rules of proper understanding scripture, including prophecy. The first one, by the way, these rules are applied daily to every written document ever written from the dawn of time by everyone. In fact, how many people do you not know that can do these things? I mean, why do we not do the same with Scripture? After all, the Scripture is by far the most important documents that we've ever heard. So the first rule is always let the author explain himself. What document has ever not let the author explain himself? After all, who knows the mind of the author better than the author himself. He can explain his own mind far better than anybody else. And don't take scriptures out of context. That's rule number two. <clears throat> In fact, when we start taking scriptures out of context, we're putting words in God's mouth he didn't say. It's like we put somebody else's words when they pull it out of a, out of a newspaper or a magazine article and you start pulling different things out and you start saying things that are not what he said he can sue you for not for misrepresenting the truth here's a good example in scripture if you were to say these three verses Judas went out and hanged himself we know that's in the scripture we also know that there's another scripture that says that Go thou and do likewise. And if we added a third scripture, completely out of context, which says, And whatsoever thou doest, doest thou quickly. We can tell somebody to go do like Judas and hang himself, but that's not what God ever said or meant. Okay, That's what happens when we pull scriptures out of context. Third rule of, of interpretation proper interpretation is that all scripture must be understood in the light of all other scriptures like a diamond for example here's one of the things that we need to understand when we take a look at this diamond this diamond is what they would call a round diamond now what shape would you call this diamond as you can see when you look at it from a different angle, it is the exact same diamond, and it's still called a round diamond. Now, when we go back into the scriptures, we might be able to say, well, uh, what, does it, what does the scripture say about what a man has to do to be saved? Well, if he went in there and said, well, you're saved by grace, and that's all there is to it. Well, then what about a saved by faith? Or what about uh, 1 Peter 3.21 says you're saved by baptism? What about Mark 16.16 16 says he that re, uh, believeth and is baptized shall be saved? What about uh, the other verses, repent and be baptized, uh, Acts 2.38? How about uh, Romans chapter 10, unless we confess, that's what saves us. 
How about Romans 8? Here's one nobody picks up on. The faith that, I mean, we're saved by hope. So which one of these can you not have to be complete? It's just like in looking at each one of those facets of that diamond say, well, I can do without that facet or that other facet or this other facet. I only want to look at the one on top. Well, you can't discard any of them because they are all connected to the same diamond of truth. So you have to understand every one of those are essential for salvation. How about this one? All words are to be understood in their literal sense, unless the evident meaning of the context forbids it. <clears throat> well, here's one of those uh, situations that people look at that and they say, I don't know. After all, isn't prophecy apocalyptic literature? Not really. I mean, when you look at it in a literal sense, it starts to make a whole lot of sense. In fact, when we start looking at this, we can take other passages. Look at John chapter 10, where Jesus says that I am the door to the sheep, and no man comes in except by me. Well, that's wonderful. Does that mean that he has doorknob and hinges? Well, in this case, here the rule would say that the evident meaning of that context forbids him to have literal doorknob and hinges. So at that point, you would say, yeah, at this point, it would be figurative language until you get to rule 10. And we're going to explain that when we get there. Rule number five, beware of special revelations from God outside of Scripture. It really gets me when I get somebody to come up to me and say, you know, God gave me this message to give to you. And I say, oh, really? What place did you get this message? Where did it come from? Did it come from Scripture? Give me book, chapter, and verse. I want to see who actually gave me this message from God. When we don't do that, what happens? We are allowing anything to come in and tell us what to think. Always question the messenger as to his credentials, as to where this is. So beware of revelations from God outside of Scripture. Number six, all obscure passages of Scripture must be understood from the light of all the clear passages of Scripture. The passages of Scripture are repeated time after time after time. In fact, it got so redundant there in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that you would say, well, I just read that, I just read that, I just read that, and people just fall asleep because they just read that three or four times. Those passages, God is emphasizing it so much, he does not want them to miss it. Okay. Now there's other passages that are less clear, and so consequently when you see something similar, then you can apply those clear passages to those obscure passages to understand it. And we can see that take place so many different places in Scripture. Rule number seven, apparent contradictions in Scripture are just that, apparent. Now, one of my favorite examples for this is 1 Samuel chapter, well, it's the last chapter. 1 Samuel, last chapter. And 2 Samuel, first chapter. So easy way to remember those, okay? In the last chapter of 1 Samuel, King Saul is about to die. He's about to be beat in a war with the Philistines. And he doesn't want to be taken captive because he knows that he will be dragged through the streets as a prize. Now, so what he does, he falls on his own sword and commits suicide. His armor bearer, seeing that he is dead, falls on his own sword, and kills himself. There's nobody around him left alive. Chapter 1 of 2 Samuel turns around and gives a different point of view. Now we have that uh, uh, Ammonite come up to King David and said, David, I just killed King Saul. What do you mean you just killed King Saul? 
Well, here he was. He was laying there wounded. He's about to die. And he tells me, please kill me so that the Philistines don't drag me through the streets. And everybody else around him was already dead. Well, guess what? Do we have a conflict in Scripture there? Remember the diamonds? When you take a look at it from a different point of view, you actually get the big picture. Now, in that case, when you put it together, yes, Saul attempted to kill himself. Have you ever seen that movie Die Hard? where the guy at the very end, uh, the one of the villains, uh, he was blonde-haired guy, he was hanging from the neck because Bruce Willis strung him up with the chain and left him there to die. And as he came back off the roof after having done all that, and fought and everything else up there on top of the roof, he comes back down, there he is hanging, it looks like he's dead. He comes down to the ground floor, talks to the cop, holding his wife, in his arms and all of a sudden the cop pulls the gun up and points it at the camera like he's going to shoot Bruce Willis until you see the camera swing around and he shoots the blonde haired guy that had been hanging from the neck with a chain. Well, we thought he was dead. That's exactly what happened to King Saul here. He thought he was dead. The armor bearer thought he was dead and so he kills himself. And then the Ammonite comes around. By that time, Saul had just come back too. He was he looked like he was dead, but he had just passed out. Okay? Anybody could make that mistake real easy. So you can see where apparent contradictions in Scripture are just that. Apparent. Okay? Rule number eight. Be cautious about the mountain view effect. Here's a great example. Remember Isaiah 9, chapter, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7? This is a passage of Scripture we sing about every Christmas time. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now that's the whole thing. I'm not going to sing it to you. I don't probably bore you to tears but anyway those are the two verses that are put together and we sing about them and what we don't realize is that the very first part of verse one or verse six actually says talks about the birth of jesus two thousand years ago and before you even get out of the same sentence, it says that he's going to be having the government on his shoulders, talking about the millennial kingdom, which hasn't happened yet. Now we begin to see a mountain view effect. Now what is a mountain view effect? Mountain view effect is like when you look at a mountain range a long ways away, you see all this is one big mountain. Now, you may see some peaks in the front, but they may be mistaken as being a mountain. But when you turn it sideways or get closer to it, you begin to see that there is distance between the mountains and even a valley that you would have never seen had you not gone to a different angle. So at that point, you can see the distance of time between, or, or the distances between the two mountains can be significant. Just like in Scripture, when we look at the mountain view effect, talking about what Daniel saw there uh, about the coming of the Christ and him crucified and then him coming back again, there is a valley between those two times of his crucifixion and his coming back to reign called the church age, which is where we are right now. That's the mountain view effect. And the Bible is literally filled with dozens and dozens of, of scriptures with the mountain view effect. So be careful. When you see the word then, that's a good indication. Look for a mountain view effect. All right, rule number nine. Ask the questions that make a great sleuth. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. The more questions you ask, the more you dig out the facts, the closer you are going to get to the truth. This will always reveal the truth and the whole at the end. Always ask questions. The more you ask, the better you get at understanding and uncovering the whole truth. And rule number 10, probably the most 
overlooked rule of proper interpretation for Scripture. Think like a Jew. Why? Because prophecy of most of Scripture was written to the Jews and explained to them in their cultural setting and therefore uses their measurement systems uh, like the number sevens, the calendar system like they're using the a lunar calendar system of 30 days per month, their time system, and even their culture as pictures of future realities so they can understand it. Since the Bible was written first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, it is easier to understand it from their perspective. Now, going back to rule number four, when we started talking about taking things literally, Remember we talked about Jesus not having a doorknob and hinges on him in John 10? Well, when you understand the Jewish culture, now you begin to see you can take it literally. Because back in that culture, when they said Jesus said he was the door to the sheep, they immediately understood the picture. Because they knew that shepherds liked to put their sheep in pens at night like caves or places with extremely high walls so that the enemy, the wolves, the, the wildlife cannot get to their sheep. And it only had one opening of, uh, across which he would lay down and literally become the door so that anything that came in to go after the sheep would literally have to cross over his body. And that's where we get the term only over my dead body. Okay, so that's why we take a look at that and see, yeah, in that case, it's more than just figurative. It is literal because Jesus really is the door and only over his dead body can Satan come and he can't do it because Jesus is our protector. Nice little picture there. Now, first thing you want to do when you start building your lesson is determine what your text is. When you determine that, your job as the teacher is to reveal truths from God's Word, not give your opinion or that of someone else's. You are His ambassador giving His message, not yours. You will give an answer or an account for your teaching when He calls you to give an account for delivery his message at the judgment day. After all, one of the things we need to remember is that we are simply mailmen delivering the mail. And if we distort it, we can do we can get into big trouble and as a federal crime, okay, if we do that to the, with the mail system. Think of what it's like when we deliver God's message. We will even get in bigger trouble for not delivering the whole message. He says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I solemnly exhort you, I charge you, the King James says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, the one who is going to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. That's what he's charging us. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. That's what our job is to teach the word. Get it out there so everybody understands the whole message. Now, once you've determined what your text is, then you can start looking at what uh, we do with it. In fact, Paul started addressing the elders at Ephesus when he said this, Therefore, I declare to you today that I am not responsible for the spiritual death of any of you. I did not avoid telling you the whole plan of God. Acts 20, verse 26 and 27. Can we say that? Or do we hide facts that all the rest of the scriptures bring out.
I've seen people do that and uh, bring out uh, facts in Scripture and just skip over them. In other words, here's a good example. I, ha I saw one preacher do this. He started off with John 3, 3 and really quoted a good job. Unless, except a man be born of the of uh, be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he turns, skips right on down there to verse 16 in John 3, and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him and should not perish but have everlasting life. He was basically teaching them what you have to do is all you have to do is believe and you'll be saved. What he skipped, which was the whole message, was the explanation that Jesus gave Nicodemus when he says, what does that mean, be born again? Does that mean I have to be born of my mother's womb again? No, Jesus says, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's talking about baptism. And people skip over that because that's not popular anymore. Well, it always has been and always will be popular in God's word because he has not removed it. As a teacher, your job is to tell the whole plan of God, not just the parts you like, but all of it. Now, here's the good example. Jonah. Remember him? He's what we call the reluctant prophet. We probably remember him as Jonah and the whale got swallowed by the whale. Why did he get swallowed by the whale? Because God told him to go to Nineveh and preach repentance so that the people wouldn't die. Okay, Those people were his enemies. He didn't want to go tell his enemies that. He wanted them to die. Okay, so he gets on a boat and goes the opposite direction. That's when the whale comes around and he's thrown in the water and the whale swallows him. Three days he's in the belly of the whale and the whale vomits him back up on the land, and this time he got the message, okay, I might not like it, but I'm going to go tell the Ninevites to repent. He did. Forty days afterwards, when he's waiting for God to destroy them and sit back under that shade that he had, all of a sudden, now he gets mad because God didn't destroy them. Well, that's part of it. He did preach repentance. He did talk to them the whole plan of God. And because of that, they did repent. And not only they did, but the entire empire of Assyria repented and saved their lives for the next generation. That's why it's important to preach the whole plan of God, even if you don't like all of it. Give your text. That's the second thing we want to do. Once we've actually picked out the text we want to do, we want to give it to him. That's why he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. 2 Timothy. Preach the word. Give him the text. Give him what God actually says. And when we do that, we've got to remember that this is God's message, not yours. You need to be faithful to him by giving his message, not your opinion or someone else's opinion. So read the text or have the text read or presented by PowerPoint or any other way that you get the text in front of the people to the audience that God has put before you. That's your job. Now, when we do that, how do we put it together? Well, we use what we call the HEAR method, H-E-A-R. That's how we build that message. Okay, what do we do? How does that work? H stands for HEAR THE WORD. The first thing you want to do is be able to digest the word yourself. You've got to understand it so that you know what the entire text is talking about. How can you explain it to someone else if you don't understand it yourself? Sometimes the text will extend beyond the chapter breaks and especially the verse breaks. So what we need to do is look for sentence breaks, not chapter verse breaks, which were, by the way, created in the 1800s. Now, 
when whoever was writing those chapter breaks and verse breaks in the Bible, I think he must have been riding horseback and ever since every time the horse jumped into a or stepped into a hole, there was another verse break or whatever. A lot of times the verses break right in the middle of a sentence and you don't even get the whole thought. That's one of the ways that this thing comes about. Now, understand since that was done in the 1800s, we need to go back and just remove the chapter breaks, remove the verse breaks, and read it like it was originally written as a letter. And then once we do that, we'll get the entire context. Now, here, speaking of context, look, watch out for words like therefore and then and other words that connect the context to each other. I and mean, usually from the previous chapter to the next. In fact, Re uh, Hebrews, not Hebrews, well, Hebrews does, but Romans is the one I was looking for. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Therefore what? Why is he beseeching them? Well, because of what he just covered in the first 11 chapters. He's talking about how the Gentiles were sinners in chapter 1, how the Jews were sinners in chapter 2. And he concludes in chapter 3 that all people were sinners. In chapter 4, he talks about how God attributed righteousness to Abraham because he was obedient to him. And then in chapter 5, we begin to see all this starting to come together, how the first Adam brought in sin and how Abraham, uh, how God brought in salvation through uh, another man called Christ. Romans 6 talks about we are not to continue in sin because that was all that those guys were dealing with. Now that we understand it, we don't need to continue in sin seeing that we have been buried with him in baptism to rise to walk in the newness of life. But Paul says in chapter 7 that I still make mistakes. I want to do it, but I fall short. It doesn't matter because what happens in, Rev in Romans chapter 8, that we are now made right by God. And by when we walk in his work. And then we see in chapters 9 through 11 how he brings the Jews back in with the Gentiles to make one body as the kingdom of God. And at that point, that's why he says, I beseech you, therefore, to present your bodies. Having learned all this about sin and the culture, now go and change the way you think and act. That's what he, uh, Romans chapter 12 this brings about and then in the last four chapters six chapters of it we begin to see there from Romans 12 to 16 that here is the way we actually will grow and change here's how we apply it that's what happens with that therefore and then too we ought to also apply to uh, the rules of proper interpretation to make sure you understand what God has to say not your opinion of what God has to say. There's so many times I've found myself wrong by saying something that God said clearly in his word, and then I'd have a little old lady come up to me and say, Ray, I won't give you a good example. I had been preaching for years about God in Exodus chapter 12 say, when I see the blood, I will pass over you there on the last plague of the of of Egypt right there and I kept saying that God is the one that brought judgment upon them and then all of a sudden there's no such thing as a death angel because it was God that did all this well the interesting thing is this little old lady came up to me and said Ray what do you do with verse 23 where it talks about the death angel is there well We'll go back to that third principle. The scriptures trumps everything. If the scripture says it, it settles it. It doesn't matter what anybody's opinion was. All that did was open up my mind to be able to see the bigger picture. All of the facets of the diamond. Now, I can understand that when God went throughout the land of Egypt, he says, okay, you see that house? That one's covered with blood. That one's mine. Don't touch it. 
That one's mine. Don't touch it. Don't touch that one. That one's covered with blood. Oh, that one's not covered. You can have that one. That one's yours. And the death angel would go in and kill him. God would execute judgment, but the executioner was the death angel. So remember, you're giving his message, not yours. You are his messenger, the mailman delivering the letter. Also, you want to write down what it says. There's a lot of times you're going to forget. That's the reason why it's real important to write it down. Then tell them what the text says. Read it to them. You can't get the text in front of them enough because they're going to miss it. All right, that was H here in the text. Now you want to explain the word. This is the E. How do we do that? Once you understand what it says, explain what it says so everyone can understand the message. That's why you go in there and you dig it out. Write down what it means. Talk about it. Sometimes to understand the difficult text, you may need to use other passages of Scripture that explains it better or clearer than what you're studying. Don't go off on a tangent with it, but then again, what you want to do is be able to use that passage to help explain it. So you make sure if you do use other passages that it relates to what your original text is saying only as examples to help explain the text. Do not go off on tangents to explain your opinions. Remember, your opinions are irrelevant. What God says is the only thing that is relevant. He is the one who does the saving not us. We just deliver the message. And number four, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, not ours. So stay with the text. He can do so in a far greater manner than you ever will do. You will only be offensive and not convincing when you try to convict people. You preach a text to somebody, they know it immediately. Okay? Here's the thing. With the Holy Spirit, you're out there, you're preaching the word that God's laid on your heart to preach. And you've dug it out. You've understood it. You are explaining it at this point. The Holy Spirit is there working too. You've got to remember, he's always explaining and convicting. He's the one that's going to make it happen. So don't assume they understand the text. Explain what it says. That's the big thing. Now, the next thing we want to do is apply the text. That's the A in the hear method. How do we apply the text? This is the heart of the message of what God's intentions are for us. Not just the audience. We are included in it as a messenger as well. So what happens in the text that helps us become better Christians? That's the thing we need to look at. We also need to ask, how can we apply the text to our lives? What can we learn from someone's example in the text to make it real in our lives? You see what happens, these are all things that actually help us understand and apply it to our lives. Watch for words like we said a while ago, therefore and then. These are great lead-ins for showing where God is making an application. Look, for example, the uh, Romans chapter 12. We've already talked about that in verses 1 and 2, as well as Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 3, which says, Therefore, see, we are encompassed by about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. What must we do to get back on target with God? This is the application. These are the things we need to be talking about. We all know, according to Romans 3.23, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we've missed the mark. So how do we get back on target? Here in the applications. Okay? Testimony can be used here to show how God changed your life in this situation. Now beware of testimonies. They're great. But a lot of people get off on tangents with the testimony and they'll spend all the time talking about testimony. What God did, how bad they were. Man, I was such a terrible sinner. Oh, you can't believe how bad I was. And they go through listing just about every sin in the book. And you say, oh my goodness. Well, God can even save that person. 
Well, here's three things you need to do when you deal with a testimony. Testimony, you start off by talking about what God saved you from. Secondly, you want to say, how did God save me? Talk about that conversion process. Your conversion process is unique to you. In fact, I could tell you what happened to me. And when you see all of these things happening, you'll see how all of the scriptures are applied, including baptism, because you can't get saved without it. Testimony number three is how. Do, what do you do after you become a Christian? Now, I loved it when we were in Africa. One of the things that we did was <clears throat> to watch the natives baptize people. They would take them out there in that big river deep in, uh, uh, which basically was about a mile wide right there at Douala, Cameroons. And uh, they would take them about a quarter of a mile out because it's only knee, uh, knee deep about that part. And they would set them down on the riverbed and they would start to preach them. These are the natives, okay? They're not the missionaries doing this because we were teaching them how to do the work and then take over the leadership and then get out of their way. That was our ministry. Uh, that was our mission motto, how to do that. But anyway, they would do this. They would get them sitting down in the riverbed and they said, now, before you're baptized, these are the sins you're going to give up. You're going to stop running around. You're going to stop committing adultery. You're going to stop stealing. You're going to stop lying. You're going to stop coveting. You're going to stop. And they go through it and they spend about 30 minutes telling them all the sins they were going to give up. Then they would baptize them and sit them right back up on the, on the uh, river bottom. And then they said, now that you're a Christian, these are the things you're going to start doing. And you're going to start going to church every Sunday. You're going to be around the Lord's table every Sunday. You're going to give your tithes and offerings every Sunday. You're going to be starting to talk to people about what Jesus did for you. You're going to be, and they go on for another 30 minutes of all the things they were going to do as a Christian. That's a testimony. This is what I gave up. This is how God brought me to him. And this is what's changed in my life. That's how you do it. So what do we do with that after that? Once we got the application done, now we do the R, respond to the word. And it's not just them, but us. Remember how many times you've heard a preacher says, now I'm stepping on my own toes up here. Well, here's where you show your response to God after you heard it, you explained it, and applied it. What is the call that the Bible is asking you to do as the leader. Once you do that, then you can ask the response as well. Make a commitment to God to follow that call yourself. You cannot expect others to follow if you don't lead by example. Okay? So you're in that boat with them. Now, the third thing is what you need, need to, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to grow? What must I do to be pleasing to God? Are great examples of how we can draw a response from those that we are teaching. Okay, when we do that, this is where most teachers decide not to teach certain things because they don't want to do it themselves. They don't want to be called out on it. Well, I saw you do this, you hypocrite. Well, that just means that there's a call for you to live up to that higher standard that God's called you to do so that you can teach the whole truth. And when you don't and you say, hey, look, I blew it like you did, just like Paul said in Romans 7, I want to do it, but my flesh fell short. Okay? I confess my sins. Remember, we are all judged by what we teach or don't teach. And when I say, hey, I've, I've sinned in this area too. Here's what I'm dealing with. I'm struggling with this sin, and I want you to pray for me. I want you to work with me. And here's the thing. When you do that, now your credibility just has improved so much because now you're not preaching at somebody. You're saying, hey, I'm in that same boat with you. And this is God's message to all of us.
Now, won't you join me as we respond to God together? What a way to bring a response to the church. Sometimes we can follow up with an invitation hymn. That's a great spot, even in Sunday school. How about remember we are not the ones doing the convicting? Remember that? This is the Holy Spirit's job, and he's great at it. That's his job. He's been doing that for ever since there was Adam and Eve. Our job is to offer an opportunity for them to make that response. That's what it is. In conclusion, and I cannot emphasize this enough, remember who you are. You're just the mailman. You're the courier of the message. You're the one delivering what somebody else wrote, and that somebody else is God, not you. The message belongs to him. And third, be faithful to your commission in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here we go again. I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God, or as the King James says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn their uh, ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. You know what that leads them? Not to heaven. Here. It's a simple message. It's a simple method. Hear the word. Digest it inside yourself. Explain it to everybody around you. Apply it. And then respond to it. You can do this even in your own personal devotions. And once you've made it yours, you can turn around and share it with everybody else. Father, we thank you that we can be here today, that we might be able to see your will in this and how we can become better teachers of the word and understand that we do have that responsibility to give it all to our listeners. They are owed your word, just like you are owed our job of going and doing it. Father, we pray that today we will not shirk that responsibility to either them or to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to Ray Duhon Ministries. If you enjoyed what you heard today, you can go to rayduhon.com for other past church growth messages and presentations. We encourage you to download the free supplemental study guides, charts, and articles to help enhance your study of tonight's subject by going to the articles page on rayduhan.com. If you would like to have Ray come to speak at your church, you can contact him on the website rayduhan.com. May God's blessing be upon you.